So, I am David Ruck. I am a filmmaker. I work uh, in the government sector where we tell the stories about the ocean and the Great Lakes. I, uh, I'm also uh, a, a Michigan football fan. I, I love the outdoors. I love swimming in the Great Lakes. I love going on trips. I love uh, learning as much about the world as I possibly can whatever that means. I love interacting with people from different walks of life, uh, different persuasions. And I'm sitting here with my good friend Gregory Cecil, who was the uh, part of the subject of a film that I did, my, my thesis film, which was uh, I Want to Be an Astronaut. And Greg can talk a little bit about his background. Uh, and, and, and Greg and I have remained friends since, since that since that experience, but we're very different politically, we've decided, we've figured out. Um, and we think that there's, there's probably been a lot of si situations that are similar to the ones that, the one that you and I found ourselves in where we are online, on social media, arguing about our viewpoints and getting nowhere with each other. and. It, it, it was nasty, and so I just want Greg to introduce himself, and our, the point of this is for us to sit down and, and try and talk about our differences and, and also try and find uh, where, we, where we agree, <laughs> right? Yeah. That, that, that's part of this, I hope. I hope that's a big part of this. I, I don't think it was nasty, it was passionate. Passionate. That's a very good word. Yes. Um, so, Greg, I'll let you introduce yourself. I'm Gregory Cecil, and uh, I'm 53 years old, and I live in Clearwater. And uh, Clearwater, Florida. Yes, Clearwater. We're in Florida. Florida. And um, I was a paramedic for 22 years, and then I went into aerospace, worked on the space shuttle program, did that until I got laid off, and then I became a school teacher, and taught middle school science, and uh, now I am a uh, college instructor. I teach in graduate school at uh, Everglades University, and I am also the coordinator for the Schools to Space program. It's an outreach program to introduce kids to the STEM career of aerospace technician. I mean, that's cool. And, and I know that you were replacing the heat-resistant tiles on the space shuttle, yes. which for many, many years was sort of the, the, the pride ship of the, the crown, crown jewels of the United States. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and if you go to the Smithsonian Museum and you see Discovery mm -hmm. sitting there underneath one of those tiles, I don't know if I'm going to get him in trouble for saying this, you, you, you and not just you, but other people, right. wrote, you wrote the names of your my kids, kids and my on, wife on those tiles, and, you're, and those have flown in space. They're on gap fillers that go in between the tiles. And they went to space, right? That, yes, several that. times. So... Greg and I have a lot in common in that sense because we both love seeing America do well yes. in space. We love our nation. Uh, but we, we've, we've sort of come to this impasse in a way over the last several months politically. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand what the hell you're talking about. And you don't understand what the hell right. I'm talking about. Um, and there's many times on there where I'm like, do I just want to hit the delete button and not be this guy's friend on Facebook anymore? Oh, uh, we never did that. We never did that. Um, I know a lot of people have probably done that. There, there are people that I just, okay, I, I can't talk to this person anymore. There, there is no election whatsoever that is worth destroying a friendship over. And it, it just, no matter how passionate and how heated our discussions got. We never unfriended each other. We never stopped talking to each other. You know, we might have to cool down for a little bit, but we... we well, I mean, we're here. It's only you know, been a couple of days, and here we are sitting down. Oh, I know. And, you know, and life goes on. And um, and that's what we want to talk about, is how we can come back together as a nation and let life go on. And, um, and explain my viewpoint, why I supported Trump, your viewpoint, why you didn't support Trump. And actually, I do not know who you support. I, I, well, I guess I should probably That's explain none that. None of my business, but you know. But I, I, it's fair to, it's fair to, 
fair to ask that. I, in the in the general election, I was supporting Hillary. Mm-hmm. I was supporting Hillary. I wasn't supporting a third party candidate. Mm-hmm. I, I felt that, and people will disagree with this. I felt like that was a throwaway vote. I, um, I get that that's your voice of democracy, yeah. and you know you like their ideas or whatever. I felt that it was well, more of a third party. Before I voted, uh, in fact, last election I hated Mitt Romney, and uh, did, I thought that he was a poor choice for our, our nation, and didn't care for the Democrat candidate either, but uh, which was Obama, and I ended up writing in Ron Paul, mm-hmm. and I knew I threw my vote away. But See, I wanted I wanted Romney to run on his record. I, w- I was like, this guy actually has a decent record, mm-hmm. and then he got co-opted by the the RNC. Mm-hmm. Is how I felt, and suddenly he's running against his record. Mm-hmm. You know, he he created Romney Care, which was the model for Obamacare, mm-hmm. which I think a lot of us agree could be better. Yeah, uh, a lot better. A lot better. Um, how we get there is, you know, In fact, of Trump's keeping two what I think is the best items out of there. Is one that pre-existing conditions. Uh, will be allowed, and that, that I think that's a big deal. And the other one is allowing students up to age 26 to stay on health insurance. And I think that's the two best things uh, that came out of Obamacare. I like his idea about opening up uh, competition between states. I mean, that that, that just seems to make logical sense. Tell you a quick little story. When I used to work on the ambulance, we were the only game in town. So Greg, Greg yeah. was uh, an ambulance Param- driver. Yeah, it was a paramedic. Don't say ambulance driver. It's offensive. Param- Param- sorry. <laughs> Greg was EMS. Yes. He was uh, EMS. Paramedic. Yeah. Paramedic. And we were the only game in town. And uh, at that time, you know, with the uniforms were sloppy. We didn't show up on time for transports, you know, because who else are you going to call? A few employees decided that they could do better spun off and started their own ambulance service. And that was the best thing that ever happened to us because suddenly we had competition. Suddenly we had to step up our game. And the dead weight employees that were causing the problems, they were let go. We brought on better people. We started showing up on time, started being dressed properly, treating patients uh, better, and, you know, and ended up out competing the competition. But if we hadn't had that competition, we would things would have never changed. Mm-hmm. Where are you going with this? Where does this go? Where does well, that, that's the point about the state competition with insurance companies. Is when insurance companies, when state barriers are lowered, mm-hmm. insurance companies can go ahead and actually compete across state lines. Then you're going to start seeing better insurance plans. I think, that, I think that's opinion. a valid valid argument. And I cheaper. It. I get that. I yeah. get that. I totally get that. So, what a lot of people are saying is that it. You know, you look at these other developed nations, mm-hmm. and they have a single-payer system. They do. Um, I'm not sure if I'm all for that, but are we, I, I are want we, to see increased competition across state lines. Okay. I think that's a good place to start. Mm-hmm. We'll see I, how it works. I, I, I do think health care should be as much of a right as clean water, um, yeah. if that's a right. I mean, you can... I talked to a woman the other day who said because national parks aren't in the Constitution that we should just do away with the national parks. So right. clean water is not in the, con- so. in the Constitution, but uh, neither is health care. But life, liberty, and pursu- pursuit of happiness is. And yes. To me, that you then have to set the groundwork for allowing that to even be a possibility. Well, it comes down to defining what is, what is the... Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What is the definition of that? And everybody has their own individual definitions. So, you know, and some think that it expands to health care and it expands to the clean water, and some people don't. And, you know, but we all have to define that as a nation, mm-hmm. exactly mm-hmm. What, that, what that is. And that changes over time, too. So for those of you that are just... Uh for those of you just joining us, uh, Greg and I were on the opposite sides of the political aisle uh, during this most recent think, election season. I think we're more in common than you think. Well, and that's why we're here. Um, we're trying to figure that out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, so we're here today basically to talk about that divide. I think, I think an important point is probably to emphasize that I think social media was pushing that divide. Um, uh, some, and I think it also served as a good conduit for a true healthy discussion. Sometimes it wasn't healthy, but I think... I felt like I was hitting walls when I would talk to folks with your views. Well, we felt the same way. 
And, uh, but at the same time, I also ran into people that actually were sitting on the fence and wanted to hear both sides and were actually listening. And, uh, and some chose my side, if you want to call it that, and some chose the other side. But they actually stopped and listened to both sides. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but there were people out there that just believed what the media told them to believe and you couldn't move them one way or the other. And, uh, and there's people out there that it's easier for them to pigeonhole somebody into something. Uh, well, you disagree with me, so you're a racist. You know, say it, then, say it again. That, that's a big, that, you know, that's a big thing that's you been going on. You disagree with me, you're a racist. And, you know, and trying to shut the conversation down. Well, so, well, so let's, let's talk about that a little bit more. Uh, uh, I mean, a lot of people, myself included, mm -hmm. feel that the things that, I mean, from the horse's mouth, I mean, he said things, he suggested things that to anyone that breathes air should think that's racist. You might not even know it's racist, but that's racist. Uh, you might not even know that's sexist, but it's sexist. We don't, we don't teach our kids to think that way anymore. Uh, I'm looking at the people he's trying to put in his cabinet, and, and, and they all look like me. <laughs> they all look like mm -hmm. you. They all look, they all, they're all white guys that, honestly, they're this guy running on, on you know, I'm going to change Washington. I'm looking at these folks, and they're players that have been there forever. Give it time. Rance Previs, uh, yes. New Gingrich. That's New the, Gingrich has some great ideas about right. space, I think. And he's a historian. I love historians so, because they get a good sense of where we are in relation to history. But people, but, people on my side right now right. Are, are afraid that because of the things he said, he's going to act on them uh, in, in a way that people are scared right now. My sister, who's adopted like I am, has dark hair and dark skin, right. and she thinks this is the most terrible thing that's ever happened. And my wife's Native American, so I'm married to a minority, probably one of the smallest minorities in the country, but we're not afraid. I look, I've read his books, and I look at the people that he's hired when he's worked in his companies, and he hires the best people. It's not, it's not based on skin color, it's not based on sex, it's based on their capabilities and what they can do. And that, that's what, um, and I'm hoping that's what he'll do uh, with this. Uh, believe it or not, he has actually opened up the transition team uh, online for America to apply because he wants the best and brightest. I ended up applying. I uh, don't know if I've really got a chance of getting hired. There's a lot more qualified people than I am out there. But the thing is, is I want to give him an opportunity to see what his staff looks like down the road. We're just in, what, five days away from the election? You know, it's still in its infancy. So. Well, we're five days from the election and people are rioting in the streets and burning flags and right. uh, something and I'm does, not proud and, of. And that does not win hearts and minds. So, uh, the, uh, for you to understand, for those of you who supported Hillary, I want you to understand why I supported Trump. For over eight years now, if I disagree with the policy of the president, I'm a racist. Just because I don't agree with the policy. Um, the big thing was like space. I did not agree with Obama's space program, and uh, and it ended up costing my, me my career that I love, and uh, because I was hoping to go on the Constellation, and unfortunately that got canceled by Obama, and then it ended up uh, we've, we've been set back probably a good ten years, and so, I'll never work in human space. So just to right update now. the audience that's just joining us, Greg right. used to work in the space program. He worked on the space shuttle mm -hmm. uh, as a contractor and he replaced the heat resistant tiles on the shuttle mm -hmm. and George W. Bush was the one that canceled in 2005 the I think 2000, is, is when he said 2003. it in motion. He said, it, he said yeah. it in motion to eventually shut down the shuttle program mm -hmm. we can't afford to do two things at once right. we're going to replace the shuttle program with Constellation mm -hmm. which was George Bush's idea of the next step in space it was two rockets that would take off one would have the people and one would have the payload. I, yes, uh, and we would go to the moon and then Mars and beyond. And Obama canceled that. Yes, and it's been replaced with the. They salvaged some of that program, and it's called the Space Launch System, which mm -hmm. is a giant behemoth of a beast. That right, I mean, just from a 
aesthetic standpoint, I would love to see this thing work. I, I, I want to see it work too. I have some doubts whether it's going to fly. Sa- but they salvaged some of that right. constellation program. Right. So the, just to give the audience some background of where you're from and, right. and, and what the constellation program is, because a lot of people probably don't know what that is. Right. So, but anyways, you know, when Obama got elected, I mean, the, the very next, you know, the, and throughout that election campaign, if you opposed Obama, you were a racist. And uh, when he got elected, I probably kicked the chair like any, you know anybody else who didn't support him that night and ran and raved a little bit. But you know what? Next day I got up and I went back to work. And everybody else went back to work. We didn't ride in the streets. We didn't burn anything down. We didn't burn the flag. You know, we resumed our lives. And But the problem is, is for the last eight years, I've been told that I'm a racist. I am told that I'm a low information or a stupid person, and I'm not. And I'm not the brightest person in the world, but I'm not stupid. You know, and I've listened to that for the last eight years, and I've listened to that throughout this campaign, and after the election's over... We're still hearing it. And after a while, it gets insulting. And after a while, it really grates on you. And the last eight years, I've really felt that we are not being heard in our government. Not just the president, but also Congress, including the Republican Congress. They weren't listening to us. And one reason... Do you feel left out of the whole system? Oh, yeah, completely. No voice at all. And and it was like that. In fact, Space Program was a microcosm of that. Because... When all this decision was being made about canceling Constellation, um, the workers never had a voice. Never once did anyone ask us. And uh, they just made the decision, and it affected our lives. And thousands of people lost their jobs. And uh, thousands of people will never work in human spaceflight again. So the government, it's the same way. And I've been down there. I've seen your, I've seen Titusville, Florida. I've seen... Yeah. 60 Minutes did a documentary yeah. that you were in. I was on it, yeah. That uh, illustrated that this once vibrant community surrounding right. Kennedy Space Center was in the doldrums. I mean, it, yeah. it, people were mowing lawns, yeah. you know, for a living or to try and make up for the money they weren't making doing what they loved, which was being involved with space. Right. So, but the. Uh, We've had no voice, and we really believe that. And, and over half this country has believed that. And, and I know that may be, may be hard for the liberals to understand, but over half of our nation has believed that they have had no voice. And Donald Trump has given that, us that voice. We decided as a nation, or as over half the nation, that we needed to get somebody that's a brawler. That's going to get a brawler. Out, a brawler. Yes, he's going to get out there, and he's actually going to fight for us. How many times do you hear politicians say, "I'm going to fight for you," you know, and they don't. They don't do anything. And he's a fighter. And yes, he's offensive. Uh, there's his, some of his behavior I do not agree with. What, what, what do you what do you not agree with? Well, I think he is sexist to a degree when it comes to treating women. I think like that tape that they had. I think part of his problem, and he should have known better, he was older, and he should know better. I think he was trying real hard to fit in with Billy Bush and, and say, oh, yeah, well, I do this with the girls. Because he was egging them on, and they were going back and forth doing the locker room talk. And I think he was trying hard to fit in with that. Does he actually behave that way? I do not know. You know, I'm not there to see. But um, that, that really, that's the way it struck me with that conversation that he was trying to fit in with this young man that was talking about women and so he, you know, they're playing the one-up game with each other. And, you know, so I don't agree with that. He's old enough he should know better. He was my age then. And, in fact, he was a little older than my age and he should have known better that you don't speak that way. You know, when I was 20 years old, I was probably just as crude and rude as as any other young man, Uh, but, you know, in locker room talk. But, you know, when you're in your 50s and 60s, you shouldn't be speaking that way. And I, you know, I, yeah. I, I can I can agree with that to a, yeah. to an extent because I think that that is so ingrained in American culture and the way that young mm-hmm. men are, have been raised is that. Well, maybe, you look maybe maybe not like Miley Cyrus. That doesn't help. I mean, you know, she's out there 
flaunting and acting that way, saying, okay, treat me like a sex object, you know, and uh, so I can see why young men would be that way. I mean, you know, you've been through locker room talking to your young man, and, you know, especially teenage boys, but when you're 50 or 60 years old, no, you shouldn't be speaking that way. You should be leading, and he didn't lead during that conversation. I, and, and none of us expect those conversations to be recorded. True. Right? True. But, you know, you should, in this day and age of the Internet, you should expect everything to be recorded. But I just wonder, you know, I mean, we live in a country with 300 million people in it. Mm -hmm. That's the best we can get is a guy that, you know... I looked at his policies. That's what I want to see. I want to see someone who's going to get down on the mat and actually fight. And I want, and, and, and I agree with a lot of his policies. And uh, if we need a change, if the way I, the way I looked at Hillary, it was the same old, same old. We we're going to have someone backed by the banks. We're going to have someone that will tell you one thing and then do another. And you know, like I said, I, I I've watched Hillary for thirty five years, uh, Hillary and Bill, and they have an extensive track record of. Not doing what's best for the nation, but doing what's best for themselves. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's the way politicians are. Is they always do what's best for themselves. They're telling us they're doing what's best for the nation. Here's an outsider that is not owned by anybody, not bought by anybody, and says that he wants to give back to our country and fight for us and really will fight for us. So I thought, let's give him a chance. That's real change. Four years from now, I'm going to reevaluate. If I don't like what he's doing, I guarantee you I'll be standing right beside you voting against him. But I'm going to give him a chance for four years. So for those of us just joining, uh, this is my good friend, uh, Greg Cecil. He was in my thesis film, uh, I Want to Be an Astronaut. Uh, he was replacing the heat-resistant tiles on the space shuttle before that program was shut down. And uh, was not invited to work on the next program. No. <laughs> uh, and, and the subsequent program that has, has come after that. Um, and we're sitting down today to talk about our differences. Because we've experienced a lot of that on, online uh, during, during this election. We really haven't spoken to each other during this whole process in any productive manner, I don't think. Uh, you and a couple of other folks that, that, that I'm not going to name were people that were frequently in my mind as my head hit the pillow at night of, of, of people that made me angry. Mm -hmm. You did. You pissed me off. I didn't, I, I don't get, I don't get your perspective. I don't understand why you don't know the things that I think I know. Um, and I think a lot of people that are, if, if anyone's watching this, I think a lot of people probably felt the same way about other people. And I think that if you look at the reality, you know, okay, Hillary and, and Trump, you can argue about the Electoral College and the, the popular yeah. vote or whatever, but for the, for the sake of argument, it's 50-50. The country split right down the yeah. middle in terms of the voting populace, and people on both sides were just getting madder and madder and madder and more divided, and, and you talk about people that hadn't made up their mind yet, but right. certainly I didn't run into that many people that online that, mm -hmm. that hadn't made up their mind yet. It was either they avoided the conversation entirely or they were all the way to the right or they were all the way to the left. And it, and it just felt like we've been going further and further and further and further. Well, I think the problem with that, too, is that you have people that decide that they're only going to have friends online that think exactly the way they do. And there's no room for growth when you do that. You have to have differing opinions. You have to have people from different backgrounds and, you know, different ways of life that, and, and have a very broad circle of friends. Because if you don't do that, you're never going to learn. You're just going to be stale. And, you know, sitting around the same group of people saying, yes, I like this. Uh, uh, you know, we all agree with each other all the time and, and, and no one ever dissents. No one ever says, hey, I've got a different idea or a different way of doing this then there's no progress ever made. You have to have diverse opinions. And you have to be, but the, the key is, you have to learn to listen to each other. And people don't want to listen. They, they, they listen long enough to make a response, 
to validate their viewpoint instead of actually just listening and saying, okay, I put myself in your shoes. I see where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do, I I hope I'm not interrupting you, but we've been getting a lot of comments on here, and I just want to like try and go through them if we can. Okay. Uh, uh, First comment here is from a guy by Tone Loke. (laughs) Ask him what he'd do if Obama said he likes to grab women by the explicit or how he'd react if Obama would keep the nation in suspense about whether or not he'd accept the results of the election. So, well, first of all, I don't know what Obama says in the privacy of the White House. So, you know, most of us never know. Uh, Nixon's a good example. And it wasn't until the Watergate tapes came out that they realized that Christian conservative Richard Nixon was uh, would curse like a sailor, and um, I think was a bit racist. And very yeah, and explicitly you know, very different man when you found out. Uh, listen to the recordings. Yeah, you know. So I don't know what Obama's like. Well, all we see is Obama, Obama's public persona, and uh, so. But but the uh, question is, I know what what, 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 what about we, what. what how would, how would you react if Obama kept the nation in suspense about whether or not he'd accept the results of the election? Trump did that. Yeah, but that wasn't keeping in suspense. It was being honest. There was, uh, I think, very valid concerns about the election being rigged. And the media was pushing, wanting him to accept the media's verdict uh, that night on who the winner was going to be. The media doesn't determine who the winner is. It's going to be the secretaries of state throughout in all 50 states that certify the election. To wait until those secretaries of state certify the election, uh, I think is a prudent thing to do. And then accept the results. You so know? you think the media played up what he was saying to be more of a... I'm not going to trust this until I trust this and, and make a big deal out of that. Right. More. If I told you to go run a red light, that it's okay, you know, and you run off and run the red light, and of course the police officers are saying, no, it's not okay. You know, it's the same way. If the media says, okay, Hillary won, you have to accept it, go ahead and concede. You know, the, mil- the, the media does not have the authority to determine who won an election. Sure. I mean, I agree. You know, it's the secretaries of state in all 50 states. To say, I'm going to withhold accepting the results of the election... Uh, and you know, and not depend on what the media tells me. That's not the, you know keeping the nation in suspense. That's saying I'm waiting until it's certified, until you know, because the media doesn't have authority to certify. It. Fair enough. I'm going to. Yeah. Blame, I'll blame the media for taking that right. too far. I can. I can. I well, can they, they took it personally, right? because they want to tell you who won. They want to tell you who to vote for. They want to tell you that you're a racist or that you're not a racist. They they want to tell you how to think. And that's not... They don't teach you two things. I mean, I agree with that. So, I mean, you know, it's like when they got all... We don't have an Edward R. Murrow anymore. No, we don't. We don't even have a Walter Cronkite anymore. We don't have anything like that. So, but, you know, the media's job is to report the news, not to tell us what we're supposed to believe. And uh, and the same thing with the election results. You know, he wasn't going to keep the nation in suspense. He was looking at saying, hey, I'm waiting until it's certified. And if there is questions in areas where possibly the the election was rigged, then you're allowed to challenge that legally in a court. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, if if Hillary had felt that something had been rigged in favor of Trump, she had the right to go to court and do that. I guarantee she would have. Yeah. I guarantee she would have. So I'm going to go to the next question here. Um... Da, 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 da. Do we have any more questions? We do. We do. We have a couple. Um, if he meant, this is from Leah, uh, if he meant build a wall metaphorically, why wouldn't he just say so? How can you expect to hold someone to their word who changes the meaning of their word to suit the situation? So if he doesn't build the wall, I guarantee you he'll lose in four years. It'll be simple as that. <laughs> that is a hard campaign promise that he made and a hard expectation that the people have voted for him. And if he does not do that, then then he'll lose their support and he'll find himself being a one-term president. 
Fair enough. So. Uh, I'm going to move on here. Um, we can talk about the wall more. Right. This is from my very good friend, Jeremy. Uh, the troubling prospect of Trump's administration being successful, though, is that it could be a... Can you read that? I, I don't... Jeremy, Jeremy's brilliant, so he uses words right. that I don't understand. What Par word is it? <laughs> Jeremy, what word is this? Uh, per, per, uh, Pyrrhic. Victory. Pyrrhic yeah. victory at the expense of the dignity of this country's historically disenfranchised. Minorities, women, immigrants. Uh, that's all it's letting me see. Yeah, what, what, what I've seen online is that people... It, it, it's getting crazy because I've seen some of them online saying, oh, he's going to deport legal immigrants. He's not. He said illegal immigrants. He's talked about uh, that he's going to, some reason, uh, one of them said that he was going to deport gays. I'm going, where did that come from? That was never discussed. And, and why would they do that? Gays are citizens of this country. You wouldn't deport them. And, uh, you know, some of it's just gotten crazy. And it's just... It, Maybe it'll be a pirate victory, and, and maybe we won't like the results of it. But the thing is, we've got to do something different. We are literally being invaded right now by third world, and uh, without any controls whatsoever determining who comes in. It's like my own house. I want to know who's coming in my house. Not just anybody's going to walk into my but house. They, but they, I mean, they, they vet. I mean, okay. Do they so, vet? When they're coming in illegally, how are they vetted? I mean, I agree with that. I, I agree that... There should be a process and people should follow. Yes. I also think that there's a lot of people, lot of people out there that are running away from things that are terrible. Uh, yes. Especially in Mexico. Mexico has... I've been there. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not a great place. These people are... Trying, all, they, all they really want is to have a better life. And they don't have the time or the luxury right. to go through some sort of process right. and wait because... Either them or their family is going to be shot within the next week. They, they've got to that. get out and of there. Hopefully we can develop a system that can be able to take that into account. The thing is, is we've got to enforce the current immigration laws that we have. And this president we have right now, Mr. Obama, has deliberately disregarded the law. And that's his job as the executive. Uh, as president of the United States is to enforce the law. And he has not enforced the law. In fact, he's, he's just shoved it aside and allowed people to come in willy-nilly. And you know that's that's not right. And you know, but so what do you gonna, that, what, what do you want to do about these folks that, that that are here that have families that that you know maybe they the came one, in here the illegally, ones, but now they got kids okay. that have grown up here. The ones that are here illegally uh, without the families, uh, they need to go home and get back in line and go through the process. The ones with families, why can't we just get them paying taxes? Why, so, why don't we just get what 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 are we gonna what, what is the what the, is the process of getting in a line? And, and filling out some paperwork and waiting for a number to be called. Like, oh, because their first act in this country was to break the law. Well, I, yeah. I, you know, and... But, for, but, but we don't know why. I don't know why they broke the law to come here. I mean, do, do you really think that, like, well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm going to go jaywalking right. across the street and, uh, you some know, hopefully of, well, the you police know, cameras don't see me. Some of them came here, they're actually, you know busting their backside, trying to get jobs and provide a good living for themselves and their family and send money back home. Other ones that have come here and said, I'm getting on the welfare system and live off taxpayer dime. And, you know, which I think if you're not a citizen of this country, you, you should not be alive. I mean, they're going to live off the... the, the if they're here to get a handout? Yeah. And if, if you made them legal citizens and they were paying taxes, then... then, then but the thing is, is how do we do the pathway to citizenship? Do we send them home and say, you will stay in line and apply to, to come to this country? Or do you say, okay, well, we're going to go ahead and reward you and just let you become citizens since you're already here? You know, what's fair? Mm -hmm. You know, the immigrants, the legal immigrants that came, that went through the process. I, and, I, and, you know, I, and I love that. I, I, why, I love that. Yeah, why... why did they have to jump through all those hoops? And then suddenly we're going to reward the ones that didn't jump through all the hoops. They right. needed to come in. I, I agree that, yeah. that that's an imperfect situation. It is an imperfect but I, situation. But I do think that there's, there's many instances where somebody runs for this place as fast as they can. I saw it when I was in 
Yeah. Well, and, and we're in Florida now, but when we were on the, the Tortugas, right. these guys that work for the Park Service are dealing with the Cubans. A thousand to four thousand to nine thousand Cubans a year right. who are, depending on who you talk to, they are fleeing a system that they just, they, they, can, they cannot live in that actually, system. Actually, that's one of the good things that Obama did. Uh, believe it or not, I said Obama did something good. It's opening up diplomatic relations with Cuba. Well, I hope we keep okay. that. I'm worried about Fidel Castro has outlived, what, five presidents? You know, let's get over it. He's, you know, that's, that's, they are the government in Cuba. That's the way it's going to be. Okay. You need more coffee. I yes, need more okay. coffee. We're going to get some more coffee here, and we're going to answer a couple more questions. Okay. For those of you that are just joining us, I'm here with my good friend, Greg, right. Greg Cecil. We, uh, we've been on the opposite end of the political spectrum this entire election season, and we've made that abundantly clear right. to each other over the course of, of the last several months uh, through text, um, right. uh, Facebook posts, etc., as probably many of you have done. Uh, we're here talking about uh, moving forward and trying to find right. common ground um, between these two perspectives, if they are two perspectives, and uh, hopefully through that inspiring others to also have a dialogue with other people. Right. The, the, the goal of this is not to find solutions uh, or, or, or agree on everything. The, the, the idea behind us going live today is to simply uh, have a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to finish the point about Obama and Cuba real quick. The whole idea... Speak and I will grab the coffee okay. and listen while okay. you're doing that. The, the whole idea behind that is if we open up with Obama opening up diplomatic relations with Cuba, that means trade, that means American tourists going there, that means uh, there's going to be tourist money flowing into the Cuban economy, and, you know, indirectly that will end up improving the life of the people in Cuba. It will also... Uh, start exposing Cubans to new ideas that the American tourists would bring. So you don't have to have these people trying to cross the uh, Florida Straits, risking their lives and coming here illegally when they can, uh, when we can start opening up relations with Cuba and doing all this trade and exchanging of ideas and stuff and end up making it, uh, well, and I, changing and the country from within. I think with Mexico, uh, eventually, especially when you get fair trade with them, I think eventually you know, that, in, that ends up being a win-win for both countries. If you have the people that were trying to escape the poverty in Mexico, if they're back in Mexico and they say, you know what, I have to stay here, I have to force my government to start making changes. Instead of using the United States as a safety valve to let people run away, and then the government's not held accountable there in Mexico. If the people have to stay there in their country and make it work, and then they have to, then they start holding their government accountable. It's well, I think I think people in America feel the same way right well, now. Well, yeah, <laughs> in a lot of ways. Yeah. We, I mean, you know, you, the uh, applications for citizenship in New Zealand and Canada are at an astronomical like level right now. Yeah, they crashed the Canadian immigration site. But I think they're going to find out Canada has rules about immigrating. And uh, I think the average time to become an, uh, a legal immigrant in Canada is 10 years. Mm -hmm. so they have a long complicated it, 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 process. It, it, it is a very long process. Yes. So, you know. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so, guess what? You're probably going to have to stay here and work the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I also agree on the on the on the Cuban side of things. Uh, right. I've had the fortunate experience working for the government to be uh, involved with filming mm -hmm. the first interaction on American soil between uh, representatives from the U.S. government right. and representatives from the Cuban government coming together. The purpose of that was to figure out how to then work under this this. Uh, cooperative agreement that right. both countries signed to figure out how we can information share and collaborate um, in, in this case uh, with regard to science within the Florida Keys and, mm -hmm. the, and uh, the, the greater Gulf of Me Mexico and greater Caribbean uh, bring them here to understand the science we've been doing and go down there and learn about their systems right. so that we can A understand better the, the connectivity that we think has been there but we haven't been able to scientifically verify because we've you know, right. you've been there and we've been here 
uh, but but to we're, we're we're not they're not the only one. they're not going to just learn from us. You know that's we're like learn that's from kind that. of the, that's kind of he, the assumption he, is human like, is supposed to have some of the best medical care. Best exactly, and that's where I was going next. The right. The, you know, there's a thing, and if I, I'll finish this thought real right. quick. That uh, when they had the uh, was it Ebola? Was that the big outbreak recently? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Or when, Zika or whatever. It was the big outbreak. There's always a new outbreak. And they were talking year. about Ebola patients coming into the right. U.S. and it was like a huge scare for a while. Right. When the nation sent doctors to Africa to deal with that, I right. think the, the United States sent like six doctors or mm-hmm. something like that, and the Cubans sent. 60 doctors. Right. Something like that. That never made the news. No. Uh, There's a lot of things that be, made the news. <laughs> uh, because they're so medically advanced, they're, they're on the cutting edge of uh, diabetes research, right. they're on the cutting edge of cancer research. These are things that we, people in the scientific community that have friends there, you know, behind the scenes sort of had some idea about, but in general, you know, we've never really been able to talk about that or share those ideas because there's been a wall. Right, you know, virtual wall between these two countries. So I, I, I think that's a beautiful thing. I think yeah. that that I applaud Obama and the administration for uh, making that a priority. And I know that it hasn't been it needs super to be, popular it's a cold in war Florida. Rally, and it needs to be over. It does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. And and we're not going to agree with them on right. on politics. Right. You know, we're not going to we're not going to find common ground on on George, George the, Washington said it best. He said, "Alliances with none, commerce with all." And, and I believe that. I, I think that staying out of, of, of alliances, but commercing with all, in other words, being a good neighbor with everybody. Yeah. And, you know. Yeah. You know let's let's continue that. Is. And I'd like yeah. to see leaders like Rubio step up to the plate and say, like, this is a, this is a good thing. We'll, see, we'll see if this he does or not. I, I don't have much faith in Rubio. On the subject of Cuba, um, that, that brings me to one of the questions that I wanted to ask you about. Sure. Um, Climate change. You're, <laughs> you're pursing your lips. I, when I, they, I'm an ad, I, I'm I an adamant believer in climate change. I, I think the science is is final. It, it is it is descript. It it, it is clear. Um, I, I I have no doubts in my mind that climate change is accelerated by human activity. And I think that there are real tangible actions that human beings can take to mitigate those those challenges. I talk to folks like you right. who think it's a hoax. Uh, Trump himself. I think, I think it's a new way of trying to increase taxes. Carbon why? tax. Why? You know, you think, so, why? why? For what, what? To what end? First of all, they cook the books. When you cook, cook the, the books, the data uh, that 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 you can look up on the internet. But the you know when the the scientists were cooking the books. Take, it's like taking a, um, uh, a temperature sensor and making sure it's put beside an air conditioner duct that's blowing out hot air to elevate the temperature. You know, there was no standard of where you're going to put these sensors or anything like that. And they, it was shown that they were doing, they were cooking the books to, to make it fit their model, when it should be the other way around, that the model was supposed to fit the data. It's bigger and, than that, though. Well, well I mean, the, they're going, going to Greenland, and you see that the ice is thirty feet, th- you know, thinner than it, than it was. You but know, how five historically? Years ago. How has that happened historically? Over I mean, a historically, time, there are there are ebbs and flows. Go, it goes up and down. Right. But there's nothing in the climate model. Right. The there's, mathematical models like, that, that 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 could indicate what is okay. happening right now like, if things were left alone. Right. There's nothing that indicates that we could be at a place that we're at right now and heading in the also direction we're heading. Antarctic ice. The, uh, you know, I, I have seen so many conflicting reports where say it's growing, the ice sheet in Antarctica, or it's shrinking, you know. It and, is and not they growing. can't seem to agree what's happening. And, you know, the thing is, in the science... You're going to be able to swim right. from Russia to the UK through the North Pole. That is going to happen. They keep saying, I want to have beachfront property in my condo eventually. I'm still waiting. For it may not happen in your lifetime. It may not. But it's on its way. It's it on is. its way. They're dealing with it in Miami right now. There's a great movie that everybody watching this, including yourself, Greg, uh-huh. you need to see Leonardo DiCaprio. This is heroic filmmaking. It's called Before the Flood. And he talks to everyone from religious leaders to scientists to politicians about this issue. Uh, something that 
he was into, introduced to at a very early age because of his prominence as an actor or whatever. People wanted to talk to him. He knew nothing about this. Uh, grew to learn more about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he takes you on a ride to, to, to see the many ways this is manifesting itself. And the mayor of Miami uh, is in that film talking right. about the billions of dollars he's having to spend to deal with For tidal rise. Um, he says that the, the, the efforts that they're making right now are, are only going to help for like maybe 40 years mm-hmm. based off the current rate. I, I mean, this, this, there's, this is indisputable evidence. But at the same time, the Russian scientists are looking at ice core samples and data, and they say we're actually going to go into a cooling period. You know, it, it just... The, the, the problem with it is... This is what it really boils down to. The problem with climate change or global warming or whatever you want to call it is we've got the politicians involved. They're not scientists. And then we also started having scientists who were chasing grant money. And of course, if the politicians involved, the politicians are saying, I want a certain outcome if you want your money. And unfortunately, there are scientists, I think, that have sold out and say, okay, I will You think you. 99% of the scientists have just well, it's sold out? it's not 99%. I don't think it's 99% I mean, at all. I mean, and the thing that really bothers me is when, you know, as a former science teacher, is when they say the science is settled. If you in science, the science is never settled. It, I, it can I, be I, I at ninety nine percent certainty. I can agree with it, but that it concept. is never settled. As more data comes in, then absolutely you, know, you revise your and, model. And, and actually, the the, the the models that they've been creating based yeah. off of what they're finding, they're thinking it's actually probably far worse than than what those models are saying. But we'll find out. But the thing is, is we need well, to get the politicians out of it. And you get the politicians out of it, and you let the scientists just actually look at the data and actually but that's and make sure it's good data. But that's happened, is it? The thing is, there's so much... The reason I have doubts about it is the fact that they got caught cooking the books. They, got, they did. Which website were you looking at yeah, that they, said they, they cooked the books? It was the guys in England that were leading the, the global warming thing. I'm trying to remember who the scientists were, but they, and they were also got caught because they were trying to suppress anybody that had a different opinion and make sure they didn't get published in scientific journals. But it, uh, it was called Climate Gate. And the thing is, is when you discredit yourself, then people will doubt what you're saying. You know, and so, and, and how many politicians, Al Gore said that, that Miami, I think, was going to be underwater by now, you know, which has not happened. So that makes the American public say, you know, come on. They, they said we we're going to have a huge amount that of doesn't, increase. That, that doesn't mean his concept that doesn't mean that his concept is wrong. The thing is, is when you put a date on things and when you, you say, oh, this is a certainty, it's going to happen, and it's going to happen by this time, and it doesn't, then you create doubt. Well, obviously that works doubt. for you. It, it created doubt with you. Well, it creates <laughs> a reasonable doubt. You're talking about, if we're going to do climate change, you're t- uh, uh, addressing climate change, you're talking about a shifting of huge amount of tax money. You're also talking about increasing a lot of tax money because they want to do these carbon taxes, and uh, which is a burden on us. And, you know, you're, you're talking about shifting a lot of resources that we better make sure that this is a certainty. And if there's a reasonable doubt, then the jury, which is the American public, uh, will say, well, you know, maybe that's not happening. This is a this is a process that it's, mm-hmm. it's like the frog in the frying pan kind of thing, you know. The boiling water, the pot of water. If you throw the frog in the hot pan, it's going to mm. immediately jump out. Right. If, you, if you slowly heat it up, the frog's right. not going to know right. what's happening, or it's not going to realize what's happening. And right. with our daily lives being the way they are, and we're busy, we're working, right. we've got families, we've got right. friends, we've got parties to go to, etc. I mean, we we. We're distracted. Uh, my, and, and my if you father, live in if you live in Missouri, right. you're you're really distracted. Yeah. My you know, father from, from what the ocean is doing. Right. Well, I'll, let, I'll let you get to your point in a second okay. here. But th- this is there. The data is ginormous. It's it's all over the place with what we I'd love what we to now see understand. the data unfiltered. That's the problem. Now the media when they go over come to the government. Okay. We have the data. Okay. 
When the media reports on the data, the media doesn't re- necessarily. No, report. the problem with the media is they, they they give weight, they give equal weight to these two people standing over here and these fifty people over here and say like, well, these are these are these are both valid arguments. I'm not seeing it, that. It, it, what I see is they push. The that is that is what has happened with the the climate discussion is that they've taken these people that are the naysayers, mm-hmm. which is this. It, scientifically, it's this, this tiny group of people mm-hmm. versus this large sum of people over here that have been doing this work for years that aren't bought out by the Koch brothers saying, you know, this is what's happening. This, yeah. is, this is what's real. And the but media's we, like, well, let's have a debate about this. There's no debate when... when it's like it's like holding a weight near and dropping it and saying, like, you know, let's discuss whether gravity exists. You know, I mean, to me, to me, it's that, it's right. that simple. It's that simple. And to me, and I, I see and right. maybe it's because I'm exposed to it every day. Maybe, and and you know, but I see what's being discussed in the media and online, so I don't see the the real hard <sighs> data. So you know, I have reason a reasonable doubt. I get that, and yeah. I, and I and I've been. And before you start, I've tried to look at it. I burden. I, I, you, you best convince me. You know. Well, and, well, and, one of the solutions is to not not increase the tax burden, but to shift it. Yes. To shift. Okay, so we're going to increase tax on. Now if you want to, if you want to do something that is going to put a shit ton of carbon right. in the atmosphere, uh, that's fine. Right. But you're going to, you know, you're going to have to then. Put that burden on right. the person buying your product, and we're gonna, you know, give you a tax. Right. So let's then, you know, reduce the tax somewhere else so that we can in- increase it there. If, if the goal is to keep the tax, you know, but, and low. and I think the the thing that would help it go a long way is if we get the politics out of it, you know, on both sides, and uh, you know, get the politicians. You know, you've got politicians say it's a fraud. You got politicians to say that it's going to happen and the sky is falling and we're all going to be underwater. You know, get the politicians completely out of it, but just the science be there. I mean, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at the, we'll I'm at the Blue Ocean Film Festival right now, which is mm-hmm. where right up the street. Big been festival, been, lots and lots of people here. I've been watching films all week about these subjects right. and hanging around with the scientists. I mean, at, at work, I, I, I work with the scientists right. that do this research and they're... People who do this research are friends of theirs, and there are people that are in the films that are being shown here, etc. Uh, I, I I don't get the sense from any of these people that it, that it, that's about creating a tax or or creating revenue or anything like that. These these people could care less about that. They, uh-huh. they, they don't they don't give a shit about uh, raising taxes or lowering taxes or, or whatever. They're, they they just yeah. love what they do or they love a place and they've spent enough time there and they're recording these changes mm-hmm. and they're mathematically figuring out that these changes are taking place at a rate that they shouldn't be. Okay. And... But look, the, 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 the thing is, is we can measure how much carbon we put into the atmosphere. Right. We can measure that. We can say, like, well, this company X is doing this, and company B is doing this, and there's 4,000 companies that are similar to this one, and 4,000 are similar to this one, or they're reporting it, or whatever, and then there's this many companies in this country that are doing something similar, and we know that X amount of carbon is going into the atmosphere every year. And we know, scientifically, because we can... Is it the carbon, or is it the methane, or is it some other gas? Greenhouse gases. Yes, it right. is a number of things. It is yeah. Methane is far more effective of being a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. It absolutely is. It's uh, like 25 times. Right. I, I'm making this number up, but it's, right. it's, it's, it's hugely, right. hugely more and, devastating. And we actually get a huge amount of methane gas, actually, from our cattle livestock. And, yes. Uh, and in fact, it was funny. I read about uh, uh, an experiment where they actually put sensors over a herd of cattle to measure the amount of methane that was coming from the cattle's gas, which sounded funny as all get out until you realize that, yes, they were looking at a greenhouse gas and, and were amazed at, at how much was being produced. It's insane. Yeah. So, But the thing is, is you have an advantage of being around scientists all the time. So you're going to be closer to the data. And to the people that's that's analyzing the data, the American public do not have that. They have filters that are going through the media and through the politicians who have decided to seize upon this. And 
So there's a lot of things I think sometimes they're saying that are said that are wrong. I think there's sometimes a lot of alarmism that is way and above beyond. And people saying, well, I'm looking around. I don't see the ocean. So what do I need to do? Because I have the information. What do I need to do to convince someone like you that this is happening? Because this affects you. This is about your grandkids. Right. I think this is where you you need to find a way where you can get the data to present it in a way that the American public can understand uh, without the filters of the media and the uh, politicians that say, these are the facts, this is what's going on. This is, you know, is carbon dioxide the culprit or not? Because I'll tell you, there's going to be a government bureaucrat out there that says, hey, wait a minute, humans exhale carbon dioxide. We can tax that. And, you know, because they never let a crisis go to waste. And, you know, to try to find a way to eliminate them and actually give the data unaltered and and explain it in a, a way that the public can understand, then you might be able to win your argument. But right now, the American public has a reasonable doubt. And, and I, I think that's been created by the media, giving, yes. giving equal weight yeah. to both arguments. Yeah. So, and talking about the media, it's like today I, I was skimming through the channels, the news channels, and went to CNN. CNN was talking about uh, Trump was going to destroy the First Amendment. He was going to have it eliminated. There will be no more free press and all that. And I'm like, where did that come from? Go over to MSNBC, and they're talking about comedians would not be able to do the comedy routines anymore because they would offend Trump. I'm like, where did that come from? What they didn't talk about was that today there was a massive earthquake in New Zealand and they had a tsunami. I think that's a little more important. And But, you know, they had a political agenda they want to push. I, I absolutely know. agree that the, the, the priorities of the media are yes. and, questionable Yes, and the at thing best. is, is when they, they go and they do absolute falsehood like that, there's nowhere ever that Trump has ever said he's going to eliminate the First Amendment. Or that he's going to shut down comedians that may criticize him. You know, since that's not, you know, when they push false things like that, then it takes everything else they say, uh, with, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The way they've behaved throughout this entire election, you, you've you got to take it with a grain of salt. Well, I think a lot of people are scratching their heads after this election. Right. Just because uh, my, my wife and I things were, that they were doing and that they've done for years did not give them the answers that they thought they don't they have any getting. credibility. Yeah. I I agree. Right. And when you you know, when you lie long enough, people stop listening to you. Or you focus on the things you're not suppo- supposed right. to you know, you focus on things that are not inconsequential, but you're you're not asking the right questions. Right. Um the British newspapers, you go down believe that road, it or not, so actually far. cover our nation better than oh, our own newspapers. Uh, uh, yeah. the BBC. Yes. I totally agree. Yes. Um, and there are other forum websites and stuff. A uh, brother of mine actually uh, served in Korea in the military. And when he came back, he told me, he said, the world news is very, very different from what we get here. And and he found that some of the news websites that he used to visit uh, when he lived in Korea, he cannot access them here in the U.S. And but they're very very different perspectives. Any good questions? We got a couple on here. I don't know that we can get to all of them. Okay. I don't know that. I'm surprised we have this many people watching. Some of them are not as productive as as others because I think we're trying to be productive today. Yes. I think that we can all agree that Trump has said some things in this election that are right disgusting. And Hillary has done some things that I think is disgusting. So and illegal. So. Um. Let me see what else we got here. My buddy Jeremy has also added a of a victory won at too great a cost to have been worthwhile for the victor. That's a pirate victory. (laughs) Thank you. And thank you for others for uh, also defining that. Uh, This is a, a, a question or a comment from Josh. Can you see how making the jump from Trump's comments about grabbing women to saying Miley Cyrus doesn't help flaunts it 
and asked to be treated like a sex object can contribute to rape. I, I don't know if that contributes to rape. Rape, to me, is not... You know, rape has nothing to do with sex. Rape has everything to do with power and assault. And, you know, rape is not about sex. It's about harming somebody and, and showing power over somebody. And, uh, you know, rapist is not... He, he's not doing that because, oh, boy, you're a good-looking girl. He's doing that because he wants to abuse them. You seem to know a lot about this, Greg. So, <laughs> I'm well-read. So, <laughs> but... Uh, you know, it's it, it's a whole different mindset, I think. You know, it's someone that wants to actually cause harm, and they say, well, if I rape them, I harm them, and they get off on that. And that's that's wrong, of course. But I don't, I, I, I can't claim to understand the mindset. The mindset, you know, it's just, you know, those people are, are just plain evil. Um... Let me see if there's any other questions okay. out here. Um, I keep forgetting to look at the camera. I keep looking at you all the time. Are you opposed to when the U.S. literally invades the third world, or is it just a problem when they come into our home? It's a valid question. I think it is a valid question. Um... When I was younger, I was like, rah, rah, you know, let's go out and fight for American freedom and all that. The older I get, I realize, you know what, if they're not messing with us, why are we messing with them? You know, but uh, I, I've really become a peacenik quite a bit, <laughs> the older I've gotten. Uh, why are we still in Iraq? Why did we go to Iraq in the first place? You know, they didn't do anything to us on 9-11. You know, Afghanistan, Bin Laden's supposed to be dead. So why 15 years later are we still there? You know, we just had several Green Berets killed yesterday. I think six of them. Why? You know, if, if Bin Laden's dead, and that was the goal, to take out the guy that masterminded 9-11, why are we still there? And yeah, I'll tell you why. It's, it's oil and opium, man. It's, it's not oil and opium uh, in Afghanistan. It's minerals, rare minerals and opium. That's the big deal, and we're protecting that. Uh, Afghanistan, I guess, is very rich in rare minerals like lithium. And so it's a big prize, not only for us, but for China and for Russia and some other uh, developed nations. So we're like, well, it's ours, and we're going to hang on to it. And, of course, they don't talk about that publicly. But, you know, we're not fighting for freedom over there. We're fighting to, for resources, and that's wrong. We need to get out, and if they decide they want to go back to the Taliban and all that, you know what? That's those people's choice. And, um, and, if, and if they don't feel that they want to fight for their own freedom, that's their choice. They've made their bed, let them lay in. Why should we be bleeding for them? You know, and Iraq's the same way. I, the, the Middle East is a mess. And uh, I, I really would love to see Trump say, you know what, we need to get out. Syria is our own mess that we created. We started that civil war, and we should not be there. The, the only government, the only nations that have been invited by the legitimate government of Syria have been Russia and China. And yet, we're there. We're the invaders. We're there supplying and helping. Uh, it's ISIS. But, of course, as long as they're inside the borders of Syria, then they're the rebels. And they're I, do, I do have to question the... Uh, Choices being made and who we are, quote unquote, backing, you yeah. know, etc. I, I, I feel like yeah. we, we, we've we've made this mistake before, where we decide we're going to help somebody out, like helping the Afghans out when they're going to fight the Russians, and then suddenly years later, all those weapons we gave them were we're fighting them, and yeah. they're using the same weapons that we gave them years before. I I, I totally agree with that. The, the thing is, if we did commerce with all. Alliances with non commerce with all. You know, we buy the oil from the Middle East and that's that. And if the Middle East jacks a price up and we don't like it, we go buy it from Venezuela. Or, you know, or we produce our own oil. You know, there's a free market out there. Instead of going in and trying to control the politics of a region that has been unstable for thousands of years, you know, just we buy the product if it's affordable, and if it's not, we go elsewhere and buy the product. Russia produces a lot of oil. We can buy oil from them mm -hmm. and natural gas. Mm -hmm. and, and 
you know, but for some reason we have to meddle. And, uh, you know, it's like me going to your house and telling you how you and your girlfriend are going to have your relationship. <laughs> you know, it's none of my business. Good luck telling her. That. Yeah, it's none of my business. I don't care <laughs> how you handle your relationship, and I don't care if it's something I don't agree with. It's none of my business. You know, uh, I think I think part of the fear is know. is that something that's taking place in one of these countries can metastasize and turn into something that has a wider reach uh, than than just the the region. Uh, it, we've it, seen it with ISIS, obviously, uh, and that there, there's a real need to address. But we were supplying weapons to ISIS. But, yeah, but, but we're here yeah. now. We're here. Yeah. Now. We need to do something. We need to we need to finish that fight. We need to right. do something. Right. Well, I tell you, the best way to finish that fight, I think, is to pull our guys out, tell Russia, have at it, and let them do it. The Russians are brutal, brutal fighters, and uh, if we get out of the way, uh, Russia fighting on behalf of Syria, and that means Russia's also bleeding on behalf of Syria instead of us bleeding on the behalf of ISIS. Let Russia go in, clean house, and leave it alone. Get out. It's none of our business. There is no national interest in Syria for us. Mm. You know, so why are we there? You know, I think that that's a confusing situation for a lot yeah. of people. And, and I think that, you know, we've got 100, I think 130 bases, military bases worldwide. Why are we the world policemen? This is something Trump's brought up, is why are we the world policemen? And why are we defending the world and no one else is paying for it. Well, I think that, you know? I think it's because we, you know, just just as much as you love this country right. and you love the values we stand for, uh, I, I think that in the interest of a stable world, right. we want to take that influence and the, that. The thing is, is defining be that the beauty of that, right? And 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 I don't want to say impose it, although it's often look like that and often probably been that. But we're imposing our version of stability. Well, I, 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 I agree that right. like, you, you, the key won't turn in every lock, right? right? You know, I get it. I get it. Right. So, you know, I, I don't see why we have to let our guys bleed. Now, if we're attacked, we hit back, we hit back as so hard that they will never do it again and anybody else considering attacking will say, you know, I don't want to go down that road. Sure. You know, but... And that's the marine philosophy. But, you know, but just because they elect a government we don't like does not mean that we need to be there. So we've been, you know? we've been, we've been broadcasting now for over an hour, Greg. Right. Uh, we could probably go on all day. Oh, yeah. And, and maybe we can answer a few more questions. Uh... How do you feel about organized labor and unions? <laughs> well, that's a loaded question. Um, my, my personal experience with unions is, I remember as a small boy, my dad worked in a power plant and the union decided to go on strike. We were on strike for six months to a year. And my mother had a wonderful coin collection. And that was her pride and joy. And I was about six or seven years old. And money got so tight, I remember my mother crying on the phone as the bill collectors were calling. And spending her coin collection at the Dairy Queen so we could have a little ice cream treat. Because we had some hotheads in the union that did not understand that they had to be compromised. Uh, finally, the strike was over. Finally, we went back to work. And believe it or not, it was a brutal enough strike that, that hurt the union people. That the union people, the next uh, 30 years, never voted to go on strike again. And uh, it hurt that bad. Yeah, it did. Um, my next experience with the unions is when I worked at the Space Center. 10% uh, of our contractor were unionized. And uh, they decided while we had a shuttle in space, which I thought was very rude, they decided that they wanted to go on strike. And uh, United Space Alliance brought in replacement workers. 
And believe it or not, we ran smoother, better. I remember going to logistics. I was asking for a device uh, called a comparator that I needed, and it was located across the street in OPF2. Now, because of the union rules, I could not walk across the street and get it from logistics over there. I had to have logistics order it, have them have a union guy decide when he wanted to get up from his coffee to drive over there and get the comparator and then drive it across the street and bring it to me. Now that usually takes 24 hours. And so when I found out it was across the street, I was like, okay, I'm not gonna have, not gonna get to do that job that day. And we have replacement workers that were working in logistics. And I, so I went back inside the high bay to find another job to do on the shuttle. And five minutes went by, I got paged overhead and they said, hey, uh, your comparators here because the non-union guys that were there as replacement workers actually went across the street got it and brought it back over and I could go and do my job the efficiency went way way up and uh, the union who was trying to hold out for a better contract ended up getting a far worse contract and their their benefits package and their pay and everything was worse than the 90% that weren't unionized um, there was a time and place we needed unions. I grew up in West Virginia with the, you know, and there were the coal mine towns where they paid you a company script, you had to shop at the company store, you had to rent a company house, and they, they, they really gouged you badly. And, uh, and of course, the unions started to fight, organize and fight back, and that was in the early 1900s. And the coal companies would bring in the Pinkerton guards mm -hmm. and we would actually commit murder and mayhem. Uh, in fact, there was an entire battle fought on a mountain in southern West Virginia that where the federal government actually had to bring in the army to put down the, the Union. And, uh, you know, at that time, yeah, we needed them. And they've helped incorporate into law a lot of protections that we have today, whether you're Union or not Union. Uh, but Unions are a lot like liberals. They don't listen. And they don't say, you know what, we need to do what's best also for the company because if we gouge the company, then we're out of a job. And we need to find a balance. And there's, there's a lot of, it's a microcosm of, of the politics going on. There's a lot of no listening going on. And sometimes that's between both sides. And, uh, but I've never had positive experiences with unions. I've never joined a union and uh, don't care to join a union. There are some people that will defend a union till the day they die. And uh, there are others that, you know, I, I'd rather be hired and paid based on my experiences and my capabilities. And uh, if the employer doesn't appreciate my experiences and capabilities, then I'll find another employer. Fair enough. Let's see. You don't agree with that, do you? I I think that that's a, a very detailed account of, uh, and, and and it does it it goes both ways. Yeah. I, I think I think that I think unions ex overextend themselves in in, in 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 situations where. Uh, Look at the. Other, it's not. It's yeah. not hel it's, it's it's not helpful. Right. But I also. But I also think that the idea of a union is to organize and and put into place protections that are going to make sure that you know before somebody fires you they should right. they, they should have done X Y and Z. Right. And the union's going to back you up to make sure that that's happened. They want to uh, fight for a fair wage. They want to make sure that you're not being you know press down, down, right. down, 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 down as, as much as they can. Obviously, some of these folks have run amok and, and, and uh, the people in charge of them have, have uh, it's documented, right. we've seen it, that they've, they've, they've taken advantage of their situation and... and uh, there, there was a guy my dad worked with, uh, now he worked in a power plant, they, they worked with generators that, that actually produce gigawatts of power and, uh, you know, very deadly if you don't know what you're doing. And there was a guy that was so incompetent that he was a danger to himself and a danger to all his other co-workers. And because he was union, they couldn't get rid of him. So his job, he was making the same amount of money as my father was, 
but he was going around screwing in light bulbs and replacing light bulbs. And of course, he was pro-union all the way. And uh, even though uh, because of his incompetence and because of his unsafe work, he should not even be there making, let alone making that kind of money just screwing in light bulbs. You know, and here's my father working on generators that could kill him if he if he did the wrong thing, and uh, and both of them were making the same amount of money, and that's not right. And uh, and my father didn't have a choice; he had to join the union because uh, West Virginia was a, a, a union state, and uh, while Florida is a right to work state, so you can choose to join the union or choose not to. Well, we've got okay tons of comments on here. I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm starting to like get a little tired here. Okay. Uh, not not because this conversation is, is tiring, but just we've been going at this for right. an hour and fifteen minutes at this point. Um, I I would I would like to try and wrap this up if okay. we can. Um, and bring this kind of back yeah. to back to the, the reason we were here to begin with is because we're two guys that, that, that really haven't been talking much. Uh, lately, because of the political divide, uh, your ideas and my ideas, and the the the, the gulf between them, um, the, the the point of this is not to find solutions. It's not to find uh, agree on all the same answers. Right. Um, I guess it is an attempt to find a solution, and the solution being having a conversation versus not having one. Right. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm David Ruck, I am a, I'm a filmmaker, I've been a filmmaker my whole life, basically, uh, got several degrees, you know, I went to college for a master's degree and then a master of fine arts degree, you know, I, I've been exposed to the, 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 the inner beltway culture, uh, yes. but, I, but I grew up in, in, in Michigan, in rural Michigan. Uh, and still have many friends there. And Greg mm -hmm. is from West Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of the few people in his family that has a master's degree. You went into work in the space program and do something that you didn't think you were going to be doing when you were a young kid. You never thought mm -hmm. you'd be doing what you were doing. Uh, we found ourselves at somewhat of an impasse this this last election cycle, as probably many of you have. And so, taking the opportunity to sit down. Uh, record our conversation. I don't think we can answer everyone's question that's no. on here because we'd be here all day. Um, but the goal, again, is is to have that conversation. And I, and I think we'll do it again. And I'd like to talk to other people. And I, and I want to encourage other people to talk to people that they might not normally uh, be talking with mm -hmm. or that have had in fact, I, I challenge every with. one of you, go sit down with somebody that, that disagrees with you politically and actually have a conversation and record it. And you can share it on Facebook or don't share it on Facebook. That's up to you. But find somebody that is a friend, a family member, whatever, that does not agree with you politically in this election and sit down and actually truly have a conversation and actually listen and put yourself in their shoes. You might learn something. Climate change is real, Greg. <laughs> I'm achieving my jury's still off. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna convert you, my friend. Um, and we're not, we're not all gonna agree on everything. Right. I think that's the point. But I think the, the, the other bigger point of this is that this is the United States of America. We, we, we had a civil war, a hundred and seventy years ago. We don't need to have another one. Right. Uh, I'm not sure if I had that, that math right. Uh, it's close enough. Uh, hundred, hundred, yeah, eighteen sixties. Uh, anyway, uh, we don't need another one, and we certainly don't need to to have blood shed over uh, the results of an election, which I am I'm not happy with. Greg is right. happier with, but I but I'd like to give this guy a chance from the perspective of he's going to be there, and I hope he does good. Uh, I hope that some of the, the fears and things that 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 my friends and I have had because of things he said are belayed. And and that that, that we move forward, uh, right. but most importantly, the day to day is is interacting with folks like Greg and 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 people that we don't we didn't necessarily agree with throughout this process. So I'm hoping that um, that we can come together 
and, and have a conversation and get along. That, um, that's the goal. Listen, Trump's going to be there for the next four years. You cannot change that. That's the way it's going to be. Now, will he be there four years after that? I don't know. Well, we'll we as a nation will reevaluate and decide. But the thing is, is that doesn't mean it's the end of the world. You can still be politically active. Don't go and burn things and riot and F this and F that. Because I guarantee you, you do not win friends or influence people doing that. Be constructive. Be adult about how you handle your opposition. It's okay to oppose. It's okay to have a different opinion. I've had a different opinion for the last eight years with the man that's in the White House right now. But I did not go out and riot and burn things down or F this or F that or whatever. You know, I wrote my congressman. I called my congressman. I, you know, would agree or not agree with their policies. And, you know, it's as simple as that. But I still went on with my day-to-day -day life and I still treated my neighbors, my friends, and everybody as polite as possible. Because you still have to live with us, and we still have to live with you. The election's over, and we got to learn how to live together. So, you know, accept it. If you want to oppose, you want to, you, to, you know, voice your opinion, that's fine. But do it in a constructive way. And believe it or not, we might listen to you. Well said. I can't really add anything to that. I just want to thank everybody that's joined us. I want to thank you, Greg, oh, thank you for, for agreeing me. to do this. This is sort of an idea I came up with this morning, and it just so happened that we could be in the same town and, and, and do it. And I thought it was appropriate because, uh, you know, Tuesday was a hard day for a lot of people, and it was a really good day for a lot of people. And I feel your pain. I people. went through that when Obama got elected. It was a hard day. Yeah. But, you know, I feel your pain. But the sooner we can... Learn to talk to each other again, I think I think the better. So I just want to shake your hand. Thank you. I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody that's that's joined us and encourage you to do the same thing with your friends, uh, family. Please even. do. Yeah. Please do. Thank you. All right. Goodbye.